Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's difficult to speak after Gary Magley's and <laughs> Dr. Hammond. But I'll do my best, and you have to deal with that. OK, uh, I come from the Cuban Academy of Sciences. I'm the Foreign Secretary. And I thank very much AAAS, not only for inviting me to be a lecturer at this panel, but also to have the panel happen and to have the TWAS, AAAS School um, Science Diplomacy. Uh, I'll be talking about, to win Gary Macleish, I have to go farther in history. I will be talking about the origins of the Cuban Academy, the origins of international science, the Cuban Academy now, the advisory role, the recognition of excellence, the promotion of sciences, the academy heritage, international activities, and the restoration of the building, and of course, the future. The origins, well, the Cuban Academy of Sciences is the first academy of sciences established outside Europe. What's the reason for this? Havana was the most important port in the New World until the end of the 18th century. And by 1830, Havana was the first producer in the whole world of sugar, coffee, tobacco, copper, and ocean liners. And everything that came into this part of the world from Europe came through Havana. Later on, New York took the premise. But until then, Havana was the center through which the culture came to this part of the world. And the, this was a bustling city, and the young people went to study to Europe and came back with this idea of establishing an academy, etc., trying to go ahead. So, in 1826, they decided the Spanish Crown request to establish an academy of sciences. They didn't pay any attention. One of the reasons might be there was not an academy of sciences in Madrid. They established their own in 46, and they granted permission to the Cubans to establish the academy. This is Havana in 1940. This is the size of the city. They, we had a person by the name of Felipe Poe who was already exchanging things with American scientists. Felipe Poe sent samples and discussed the publication of papers with people at the National Museum of Natural History and the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia, Peabody Museum, etc. This is one of the founders of the Academy. Also, Carlos Finlay. Carlos Finlay was a physician that worked on the transmission of yellow fever. And in 1881, he published a paper stating that mosquitoes were the transmitters. He got only proved to prove that 20 years after that. But the academy was established in 1861 by these guys and others, 30 scientists elected by, peer review, by their peers. And it was a very effective academy until the end of that century. Then. In 1899, the first meeting of the International Association of Academy took place in Wiesbaden, and there was no Cuban there because at that time, Cuba was occupied by the US, but we were represented by the US representative who was there. And this was the origin of what eventually became the International Council for Science, in which the Cuban Academy was founder. However, after the triumph of the, the end of the Spanish-American War in, 19, in 1898 and the U.S. occupation. The interest of investments in Cuba was mainly plantations, sugar mills, etc. There was little support for science. And the academy dwindled a little because it was kept run only by scientists themselves. There was little support. There was little money for science. In fact, in a mission of the World Bank in 1950, they concluded that in the field of scientific research and labs, there were no developments at all in Cuba. In 1960, Fidel Castro, visiting the academy, the building in which I work, said these words. 
the future of our country has to be necessarily a future of men and women of science. Everybody thought he was dreaming, of course. Less known is that Che Guevara visited the academy four years later and said more or less the same. The basis of continuous development in the future year lies in never developing scientific endeavor. The fact is that we came to the possibility of exhibiting you again the same photograph. Uh, an academy was strengthened by the support, a continual political will supporting the development of science. In 20 years, we had a much stronger scientific establishment. And this is the signing of the reestablishment of the links with the Smithsonian. There's only one person, very important person missing in that picture, and that would be Ross Simons, who was at the time the head of international activities at the Smithsonian, with which I discussed for several months the drafting of the document that is still in place, because we intentionally put no sunset clause on that document. We decided it would be something that cannot be destroyed in the future. It's still in place. It supports exchanges with the Smithsonian. That was the result of the work of Dr. Abelardo Moreno, standing in the back, who used to be the best students of Carlos de la Torre, who used to be the best students of Felipe Poy. So this is the same tradition continued along. Not only that, but we increased exchanges with the biomedical and biotech community through the help of a couple of persons. Some of you know Lynn Margulis and Harleen Halverson. They were both helping us develop the biotech infrastructure in Cuba and training of Cuban scientists. The, the, the person, the second person to the right is the president of the Academy of Sciences of Cuba now. He was the Secretary General at that time. And in 97, we received the visit of Dr. Rita Colwell, who is with us today, and I was so happy to say hello again to her, which was, had these words, in some we saw the state of Cuban life sciences research and applications to be at a high level, competitive with Western Europe and the US. And also, because the Cuban Academy includes all scientists and all uh, humanities as well, with the American, Soci American Council of Learned Societies and Social Science Research Council, we're able to establish continued exchange to provide grounds for cooperation among young Cuban scientists and scientists in the US. In the year 2002, we had the first opportunity to present to AAAS the opportunities for cooperation in several disciplines in which there is good, proficient results, scientific results in Cuba. Sustainable agriculture, renewable energies, tropical medicine, and genetic engineering and biotech. Ten years before, and I did not put that because I only have 15 minutes and I'm running short of time, we received the treasure of AAAS in Cuba in 1992 for the 30th anniversary of the rebirth of the academy after the revolution, Dr. Bill Golden, who at the same time was the first person who implemented the experience of OSS into advice to science, and he was the science advisor to President Truman, the first such capacity. That year we commemorated at the Smithsonian with a huge presentation and the report of many of the results that were achieved by this group that restarted links in the 80s, the centennial of Felipe Poi and his exchanges with Cuba. The Cuban Academy now celebrated in 2011 the 150th anniversary. We have more people now at the Academy, we're at 250. And we have an important role in advising 
the state of science and speaking to government, as was said here. This is a report to the plenary session of the Academy of a previous report that had been presented to the government on the state of science in Cuba. And this is the discussion in three different occasions in the three 